commence um, hearing. Welcome to the um, postponed and delayed hearing two, part one, introduction and general provisions. Um, just before we hear from our first submitter, anything from uh, officers for us this morning? Mm -hmm. um, she said I requested her submission point, um, but actually I didn't actually check her um, submission point and her submission point, um, her group submission point and the original submission point from um, From Fulton Hogan as well. Yeah. Um, yep. So with um Devine Penny's one, does it which um, actual provision and and does that affect? Yep, so in terms of the recommended amendments to the provisions that was in the 42A report, what, what provision is it? The um, definition of clean film. Yeah. Um, and then we ran on the basis of the rough that I received. Okay. The submission point that I actually accepted and accepted. Right. So you accepted the submission point, but it was based on the rough that I received. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
To simplify matters, we simply recommend the Council cures the conflict by excluding freedom camping from the district plan. And one approach that we've noticed is the Dunedin second generation plan that explicitly notes freedom camping is not managed by the plan, rather it is managed through a freedom camping bylaw. In terms of the definition of buildings, approximately 900 members, both individuals and, and singles, reside in the Selwyn district. And we estimate just under half of those own non-motorised caravans. Most of our members live in the residential and rural zones, and they may require resource consents to store their caravans at home in between their weekend excursions and road trips around New Zealand. And as our membership grows, that will also apply to new members that come into the district with non-motorised caravans. Now, we believe that our members' caravans have no more effect on the receiving environment than self-propelled motorhomes, which are explicitly exempt from the definition. The Section 42A report recommends retaining the definition of building while noting the Council is, and I quote, unable to consider requests to alter these definitions. Now, with respect, we suspect the writer hasn't picked up on the nuance with the national planning standards and therefore has misunderstood the Council's ability to apply a subcategory approach on the basis that is clearly provided for by the NPS. Our submission is supported by legal advice from Simpson Grierson, and we also note other proposed plans have used subcategories. For example, the recently notified Polydua City District Plan and the New Plymouth District Plan we both adopted the NPS definition for educational facility, which means land or buildings used for teaching or training by childcare services, schools, or tertiary education services, including any ancillary activities. Now, both plans have decided to include a separate definition of the term childcare services on the basis that this subcategory is required to assist with plan interpretation. So we recommend the Salwan District Plan reconsiders the options presented in our submission with a view to excluding non-motor caravans, and importantly, um, with that, other than those used for residential accommodation or business purposes. So otherwise, Kiwis who own non-motorised caravans for recreational purposes, and I want to emphasise it's recreational purposes, or who want to establish private motorhome parks for recreational purposes to help reduce the pressure on council infrastructure, may unnecessarily have to apply for resource consent if the plan is adopted as is. I now want to hand over to Raya, who will finish our submission with a brief overview on how the definition will apply to members who own non-motorised caravans in your district. Thanks, Raya. Um, in addition to what James said, I had a um, deep look into the um, district plan rules, and I note that the um, if we look at two examples, the general rural zone and the general residential zones, both of these zones require a discretionary activity resource consent for activities that are not provided for. Um, and this activity also includes buildings. Whereas if we were to look at the large format retail zone and the town centre zone, these zones specifically provide for buildings as a permitted activity. So if we were to compare the two, um, it just shows most of the zones where people would be living and owning caravans like the general residential zone, the rural zone, the um, large lot residential zones, they would require a discretionary activity resource consent to own and have a caravan on site. Now, there would be certain standards that they would probably need to meet when they do apply for consent, like you know, having a shelter um, around their caravans or maybe having some sort of privacy planting. And we don't think that is feasible or reasonable to ask people who have motorhomes that they are fine to have it, but whereas people who have caravans require a resource consent to have their vehicles parked on site. Thank you. Thanks, Raya. Um, we're happy to receive any questions from the panel. Great, thank you very much for that. <clears throat> Gary, any questions? Thank you. Just make sure this is all working. Thank you, uh, Mr. Imlach. Um, just, I just read your submission. Uh, going back to your submission, I'm not sure if you have that in front of you. Do, do you have that, your written submission? Um, let me try and bring it up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, we're all working from laptops at the moment. Um, I do have the submission in front of me, yes. 
Okay, I'm, I'm just looking at your paragraphs 14. This is options to address the issue, paragraphs 14, 15 and onwards. Yep. And I, I just want clarification, please, on paragraph 16. Um, you refer to a recommendations report which acknowledges non-motorised caravans will meet the definition and it raises the potential for local authorities to use subcategories, which is what you've just talked about. And then yep. you've, got, you've got a quote there. Um, I just wanted to ask you, what, what is the recommendations report you're referring to there? It's not the Section 42A report here, is it? Is it the report for the... NPS? No, that's the uh, Ministry for the Environment's report on the NPS standards. Right. So, so are you saying to us, therefore, that um, that gives a fairly, you know, clear steer towards councils that they can use subcategories, um, and, and you're saying in situations like this? Absolutely. So this, this is taken directly out of the MFE report, because um, they did acknowledge that there is obviously going to be that conflict. Um, and we do accept that it's early days and, you know, a lot of councils are going through their district plan reviews. They're going to have to turn their minds to whether this option is suitable for their, for their plans. Um, we're only aware of those two examples that I gave to you in the, in the oral submission for New Plymouth and Porirua. Um, but we do think that the, the Ministry has definitely given a clear steer that if, if councils think it's necessary that they can adopt those subcategories to deal with the issue that we've raised. Okay, I understand that. Uh, I guess the next question is for the officer to uh, be aware of. I'm interested to know what, what your um, thoughts are on the merits of this request, um, other than it being caught up by the what you see as fairly rigid NPS directions. If we were to accept that there is another way to do this in terms of subcategories, what would be the merits of it for this, for this submitter? Um, you can either answer that now or later. So that would be best addressed in your end of hearing reply report once you've given it due consideration. So yeah, thank you. Really, really just trying to understand whether there's some merit in what the submitter is requesting if we put aside the NPS requirements as, as we see them, as you see them. Okay. Um, that's one question I had. Thank you. Raymond, do you have any questions? Just to build on um, the last question, you offer two options and then your lawyer offers a third option at their paragraph 7.6. Would the third option be the most workable and practical option for councillor to adopt, given what they're trying to attempt to control? Um, um, sorry, so you're saying that the, gave, the third option in um, the submission from Simpson Grierson was talking about yeah, practice, practice notes. Note. Is that what you're suggesting? Yes. It is an option. I guess the only risk of that is it doesn't avoid the confusion to debate over what is defined as a building if it came to, you know, a consent hearing or an appeal. That's the only issue. So if the practice note clearly set out how to treat non-motorised caravans, would that, would that help? I, I think it would certainly go, it would help a lot um, if you weren't able to consider the first two options um, because you know, what we're going to find down the track is, you know, five, ten years' time. We, we know from our experience that um, if we were wanting to find ways to create better management plans with council around dealing with freedom camping, uh, or even dealing with buildings on site, I should say, um, having having that clear guidance would, would obviously make it easier for us to work with the council. So if, if that was an option, um, we, would, we would certainly encourage that. But our preference is actually to make it very clear in the definitions that non-motorised caravans that are used for recreational purposes uh, are not defined as buildings. Okay, thank you. Um, just in terms of uh, the relief that you seek on these two issues, um, exclusion of freedom camping from the plan and then dealing with the issue of non-motorised caravans, it's probably been some time since you wrote the original submission and you've obviously been considering this further in relation to other district plans around the country. <laughs> So I'd like to give you the opportunity to come back to us with some specific wording and outline to us specific amendments to the notified plan provisions that would address the concerns that you have on both of those two issues. Okay. Are you able to do that? And then that will give us some, um, then we can make a really nice and informed decision about the issues that you brought before us. And if you obviously know these issues inside out, so if you could give some thought to some very specific wording to, either definitions or other provisions in the plan that would satisfy your concern, that would be very helpful. And uh, are you able to do that, say, by the end of this week, or is that too tight a time frame? 
No, we should be able to come back to you by the end of this week with that explicit wording and how we would see it work in the plan. Yeah, certainly we understand the issue. We understand the problem with the national planning standards and the fact those definitions can't be amended. But yeah, if you've got some creative solutions, it would be great. We'll do. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we do use uh, subset definitions in the plan. So for example, retail is a subset of commercial. Um, and in this case, we've realized that non-motorized caravans um, could run into an issue. So we've developed an additional definition of ancillary structure, which includes um, caravans um, amongst other things. And so there are rules in the plan managing ancillary structures so that they're separate from buildings so that people don't need to get resource consents unnecessarily. I'm realizing that people would want to store caravans and trailers on their properties. Um, and in regards to um, freedom camping, Selwyn does have a freedom camping bylaw. Um, so I think we've tried to steer clear of managing it via the district plan. I yep. think it would be considered a temporary activity, um, but I believe the New Zealand Motor Caravan Association's submission point relating to uh, freedom camping has been assigned to the temporary activities hearing. So just to keep in mind that there will be another 42 a report actually going into depth on that. Uh, but we do have subset definitions and it does cover caravans. All right, so could you hear that one from the 42 a reporting office? So what I'd invite you to both to do is to um, later on um, get, put your heads together, have a discussion about the issues that the officers just brought to our attention and see if that resolves your concern. And if not, then maybe work with the officers on some further wording. So if I could invite you both to do that, that would be appreciated. I think that's fine. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks for, okay. thanks for zooming in. Thanks very much for your time. Yes. Thank you. Right, Crisis Road Rezoning Group. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Thompson. Good morning and welcome. You've been before us before, so you know the drill. I don't need to re uh, repeat it for you, but I will just remind you that we have read uh, the pre-circulated material, so you don't need to read that out loud to us, but you're very welcome to highlight key points. Um, no, I've got nothing from the evidence, uh, Mr. Chair. Probably just to um, really emphasise the issue here, which essentially is the future you know, around Prebleton's growth. Um, so, as I've said in, in my other briefs of evidence, um, there's a kind of a synergy here between what's in this submission and what uh, is uh, sought in both the strategic directions and the urban growth chapters, which of course you haven't um, heard yet. So, it, it, and I, I accept the uh, comments in the section 42A report, which um, the submission itself, in terms of where it sits, in from a definition point of view, is probably a little bit clumsy. But I don't think there, I can't see any other option for recognising what you know, I consider Prebleton to be a little bit of out of kilter with the rest of the township network. And in <clears throat> future, and uh, urban growth evidence, I will be probably, I'll be putting that case a little bit more as to how that network needs to be adjusted to accommodate Prebleton's future role in the district. So that's probably all I want to say. I'm more than happy to answer questions on that. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that for the moment and just uh, respond to questions. All right, thank you very much for that. Malcolm, do you have any questions? Mr Thompson? Yes, I do have some questions, Mr Thompson. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I noticed in your uh, section nine, you're talking about the documents you've referenced and getting your view. Have you referenced the Prebleton Structure Plan? And are you aware of the community's previous uh, wish to remain a village and sort of be more compact in form? Yes. You have? Yes. Yes. And has um, your group made any contact with the uh, Resident Association to see if they're on board with your ideas? Or? Um, not that I'm aware of. Okay. 
Thanks for that. Um, another one down here somewhere, let's open it up. Yeah, section 14, um, which we probably may traverse some of these later on in urban growth, actually, Mr. Thompson. Um, you state that uh, Brewerton is strategically located close to key activity centres in the large and growing commercial industrial business areas in southwest Christchurch. Um, many of these are indeed closer than um, the key activity centres of Lincoln and Rolleston, and um, uh, would seem to me that changing the activity centre to a key one would duplicate what we already have in a closer environs to Prebleton than what we have now. Do you still believe that that would be necessary to increase that amount of commercial? In Prebleton? Yes. Uh, not in the short term. Not I've, in the short term. No, I'll, I'll make a comment perhaps in the long term, and I'm talking in the long term as 10 plus years. Right. Uh, that it, it may get to that stage, but um, as I say, you've already got, well, the North Halls or one hasn't been built yet, of course. It's been, um, been and been consented and built as we, you know, starting as we speak. Um, so I think it would be, um, yeah, a, a duplication. Probably, the, I doubt whether the retail analysis would stack up at the moment for a key activity centre at Prebleton. Right. Okay. Thanks. That, that answers my question. I've just, Referring to you, you do quote further on, um, just trying to find the section where you're showing the amount of growth there is in the retail there at the moment that it looks to be going to be somewhat reasonably serviced in the near just short distance future. Yes, uh, a comment on the <clears throat> activity centre status of Prebleton and and what the regional policy statement says as well. And, and everything it's, it's a um, fine balance as you would appreciate, um, but. Yeah, as Prebleton grows, I can imagine it, it, it will be more jobs um, attracted there, uh, particularly in retail. But of course, you know, but I just acknowledge that the regional policy statement that stands mentions you know, Prebleton as a self, you know, becoming more self sustainable in terms of jobs. But I, if you took a wider view of that, um, it's only a stone's throw to the main industrial area of Christchurch. So I wouldn't. Imagine Prebleton, um, you know, developing into a large commercial or industrial hub or anything like that. Yeah, um, thank you for that. I was going to bring up um, that objective six point two point two, uh, which you've elo eloquently done for me. So, thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. That's all I have at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Gary. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Yeah, just one question. I understand your evidence, and um, I think it comes up in the context of urban growth as well. Um, but in terms of your paragraphs 15 onwards, um, I just wanted to clarify, you've raised an interpretational matter about whether Rolleston, um, sorry, whether Prebleton is in fact a key activity centre by default, I think you've said. Um, and it, it's clearly not shown on map A, but there is a phrase that you've drawn to our attention in the CRPS 6265, where it says, uh, it, it refers to Prebleton as part of the self-sufficient growth of towns of Rangiora, Kaipoi, et cetera. Um, and so what you've taken from that, it seems, is that it is, in fact, intended to be a key activity centre, even though it's not shown on map A. Is that what you're suggesting to us? No. Uh, I, 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 all I'm really saying here is that it, it sits above other one or two other centres in the township and activity centre network. It's, it's, I don't think there's any perfect solution to this. It, uh, neither hierarchies sit very comfortably as a as a sort of a rash, you know, in, you know, as a rational order. Um, so it is a relative thing. Um, what I've taken from the RPS is that um, Prebleton is probably going to grow perhaps more than what the township hierarchy says. I think that, that's probably the nub of my submission here. Uh, it's, it's already almost at the stage where it is in the next, it, it's, you can distinguish it certainly from Leeston um, and possibly Darfield as well, although Darfield is a true rural centre in my opinion. Prebleton's an oddball in the sense that it sits on the edge of large Christchurch urban area. And I do appreciate Commissioner Lyle's um, comment before about you know that village environment which people um, in Prebleton value. But you know, looking longer term and um, 
the way that Prebleton interacts with particularly Christchurch, um, there, it's, uh, I can't help thinking that um, it, it'll go the same way as Hallsville did in, in time. But Hallsville was a separate village as well and got gobbled up. I mean, I hate to see that with Prebleton, um, and that, that gap is important. Um, but I can see because of where it's located and with the way the housing market is functioning at the moment, that the extra pressure will come on Prebleton um, to expand. And I think the township network probably needs to reflect that a little more. Okay. Um, yes, I understand that. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple of questions, just picking up on the population growth comments you made. I take it you don't agree with the Selwyn Development, District Development Strategy for Selwyn 2031 that estimated the population growth for Prebleton to be between 1,500 and 6,000 by 2031? Well, no, I think that well, I, I agree with that. Um, that it looks like to me, unless I've um, uh, mistaken that it's going to reach 6,000 by about 2022, 2023, because right. I think it's over 5,500 now. Right. Okay. So it, it is going to step up into the next level of the hierarchy in two or three years' time. Okay. Um, and my last question is, did the Trisis Regroup Rezoning Group comment on the development strategy for Selwyn 2031? Um, you were talking about the district development strategy oh, that was led in 2014. Yes, so the, the district development strategy for 2000, Selwyn 2031 yeah, 20, yes, is, what, is where all the service activity and key activity centres criteria came from. And also the, pop, the estimated population growth for each. Mm. I just wondered whether you commented on that development of that strategy? I don't think the residents uh, group did, um, but I have in my evidence um, saying that it's, um, and I have to say that the planning of Selwyn has been exceptional. I just want to put that in there because I don't, I don't want to come across as saying that the plans are wrong. I think what Selwyn has done from its planning framework through its It's it's um, you know top draw planning, but it's 2014 um, is it's you know probably data based on 2013. So that data is now eight years and nine years old, and a lot has happened since then. And I know that the population forecasts have been uh, have been adjusted recently, uh, but the town centre hierarchy and the activity centre hierarchy haven't. I don't think they reflect that population growth now. And of course, you know, one of the comments is that, um, you know, the district development strategy may be the document to set that hi those hierarchies out. And that's one approach. Um, but I don't, you know, I, I think a spatial planning exercise such as a district plan could also uh, uh, review or readjust that, those two hierarchies. Okay, thank yeah. you. Uh, so, Ms. Thompson, just one question from me. In terms of this particular hearing, we're looking at definitions, and I think the original submission that you lodged, rather than the further submissions, you sought amendments to the definitions of service activity centre and township network. And you commenced your presentation this morning by saying you admitted that changing those definitions was a little bit clumsy. Mm. So I just want to clarify, are you still seeking that relief? Are you still seeking changes to those definitions, or are you going to bring different kind of relief to us later on in the process? Look, if, if, if that's the only option to rec, if there's no scope to adjust those two networks within the any of the submissions on strategic directions or urban growth mm -hmm. or, or definitions, I think there's one submission I've um, relied upon there where there may be scope. I think um, Jill Thompson, I think, um, no relation by the way. Um, <laughs> Then I think you know the, the, this is a probably the least preferable way of doing it because mm -hmm. I don't think it really sits well with what a definition should be. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, one of the thoughts I had was that the, the, that the glossary could be used to set out what a um, 
you know, what a, what a, town's, a, a township network or activity centre network is. But I don't think a glossary is appropriate either. I think that's more of a more general explanation. And I think those two um, concepts, um, township network, activity centre network, have a, a huge policy implication for the way Selwyn uh, um, allocates its growth in the future. Okay. So last resort, I think. Yeah, so you're still seeking that relief that's in the original submissions. At the moment. Less preferable option in your view, but if, if it's the sort of only way of dealing with the issue, then that still yes. remains live. Okay, thanks very much for clarifying that and thank you for coming in this morning. Okay. And I don't think we've got any other submitters just yet, do we? All right, so we'll just um, adjourn momentarily.
All right, good morning again, everyone. We'll resume the hearing of um, submissions on <clears throat> um, introduction and general provisions of the district plan. And at this stage, we're hearing from Davina Penny. Good morning and welcome. So thank you very much for putting in the original submission and then your written material and then your amended written material. We do appreciate that. We've read that, so you don't need to read that out loud to us. Um, but you're very welcome to highlight key points for us and just um, if you've got a presentation there, run through that for us and then we'll see if we have any questions for you, that's okay. And we've, got, we've developed a little local rule in here that if, if you're uncomfortable speaking with a mask, you can take your mask off when you're speaking into the microphone if you'd like to, otherwise, but that's up to you. All right, thanks. It's not an experience you can say you have every day, so I'll see how it goes. Yeah, when I put my submission in um, initially, uh, I accepted that was the initial submission, and I was advised the subsequent one I could send in advance just to save printing out the 15 costs. So if I could go through that, that would be appreciated because I can go through that with the slides, yeah. And sorry, there was just one thing I forgot to say. The um, Our reporting officers have, um, this morning, they explained to us how they um, responded to your submission and the recommendation report. So if you just want to cover that again. So initially in the 42A report, I said that I rejected your further submission point one, um, but after reviewing everything, I realised that I actually accept your submission point to retain the virgin clause in the, um, in the definition of clean film material. It's just that change. Thank you. So can I just go through and then yes. go through the slides? Thank you very much. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my submission to you today. And I wish to start by saying um, there was a requirement for further submissions to be forwarded to the party subject to the original submission. Uh, I forwarded mine to Mr. Ensor on the 9th of May from Fulton Hogan, but didn't receive any further submission from Fulton Hogan when they made their further submission points. As you can see, firstly, I'm discussing FS001, which uh, relates to the request to be allowed to use contaminated clean fill, and I do strongly oppose this. It's worth mentioning before I give my reasons that an eye has to be turned towards the issue of the replacement to the RMA, that being the Natural and Built Environments Act. There is to be more stringent attention when consenting with regards to outcomes. And the issue of claiming effects will be less than minor will not be a criteria with which to gauge effects. And this is a welcome change to current RMA assessment requirements. Yes, effects will be need to be heeded, but the main focus is to be outcomes. In addition, there are to be margins of safety and environmental bottom lines, and the precautionary principle, thankfully, is going to be also codified. So the free reign that is taken advantage of under the RMA, hopefully, will not be permitted in the future. It's to note that Thornton Hogan's reasoning for making this request is purely linked to profits. The request indicated that using only virgin clean fill severely limits the ability of operators to rehabilitate quarry areas as part of a quarrying activity due to the lack of availability of such material at any reasonable cost. Unfortunately, SDC do not have any quarry rehabilitation plan guidance as Christchurch City Council do. And I also found out recently, Christchurch City Council also have a bylaw with regards to clean fill, which Selwyn District Council don't have. And that might be something worth considering for the future because that does give um, extra, if you like, rights to the council with regards to their monitoring and enforcement and any actions they do take. Therefore, they do not have guidelines and minimal standard requirements. And this leads us to a situation whereby the industry are going to, in effect, want to push boundaries due to there being no minimal standards. And this makes it difficult for decision makers to correlate proposal from applications against district plans. Quarrying in this region is permitted to within one metre of highest recorded groundwater level, and these depths are often calculated with no on-site bore providing definitive information. Therefore, we have situations whereby operators calculate the levels using bores that may not be representative of what is happening on the site for a variety of reasons. So there are risks that overquarrying will occur, whereby this separation distance is not maintained. Overquarrying has occurred to the extent water is exposed on the surface, and that has been confirmed with inquiries through the uh, Christchurch Regional uh, Canterbury Regional Council. In addition, water levels are expected to rise in this region due to increases in aquifer levels linked to the Central Plains Water Scheme, and we also have to take into account the um, uncertainties, but predictions from the climate change issues. 
Therefore, there are risks whereby water is either going to come into contact with such clean fill, either during operations or post operations. This increases the risk of contamination. And should this occur after operations, the issue of liability is going to come into play. And this risk should not be increased through the permitting of contaminated clean fill material. The MOV guide regarding clean fill is specific and stringent for a good reason. Selwyn is likely to be a significant supplier of aggregate for many decades to come. And it can be assumed if this is permitted, all operators will use contaminated clean fill. There was no indication as to how much contaminated clean fill has been requested. No indication as to the ratio compared to virgin clean fill, nor over what size of area it would be used. No indication as to what actually is classified as lightly contaminated clean fill. And the slides I'm showing you, um, I will be discussing further in detail as to their source and their relevance. If you do not have that list and do not have truly independent advice, I do not believe you are in a position to grant such a request. It would be contrary to environmental requirements and lead to water contamination. Operators are already breaching rules regarding clean fill. And the images I'm showing you from a site which was supposed to be quarried to within one meter above highest recorded groundwater levels in Yaltest. And it was signed off as rehabilitated last year by both the regional and Christchurch City Councils. Now, the images I'm showing you, I've actually witnessed myself. I visited the site three times and I have witnessed the gradual deterioration each visit. Um, I was advised and shown the video from only the 16th of September, only a few days ago, whereby areas in the centre of the site have got standing water. And obviously, I'm not an expert. I'm not going to explain what I think's happened there. But we haven't had rain for a significant period of time, so that will be something I'm sure the councils who are doing the investigations will be concerned about. The images are of material that has come through the surface since the rehabilitation has been undertaken. And I'm not going to concentrate on that aspect in detail because it is a subject of a different hearing. But there are indications of illegal clean fill, and certainly not which was consented, including what appears to be a rotting baby's nappy. And that water could be coming up from below, and it may not be just undrained water. We just don't know. So the questions are, what material is that water coming into contact with? And what risks are there to drinking water? The owner had the surface water tested, and it had a level of E. coli of 25. She was rightly distressed for a period of time until she had her own well water tested. And when she did, that also had high results for iron and manganese, and she's been told it does not meet drinking water standards. With regards to this next paragraph, I have received information from the Regional Council of hail material that had been accepted at the Pound Road site in 2020, which is the Fulton Hogan site, that had been tipped and not removed from the site. I'm yet to receive the information verifying full details of glass I've been advised had also been taken to the Pound Road site, so I won't comment on that particular aspect at this stage because it's still unverified through the LGOMA requests I'm making. I had expected that response in time for the hearing, but it hasn't come through. If operators are lax in obeying the current rules, they should not be allowed to have relaxed rules. The risks are just too high. And I therefore propose only virgin clean fill should be permitted. Operational costs should not be prioritised over cost to the environment. That should be the environmental bottom line. We've got another photograph here of just showing issues of the uh, standing water of the site. With regards to the further submission point 11, this relates to the request by Winston's to include quarrying in the definition of highly productive, and this also is strongly opposed. The National Planning Standard definition of primary production should not be used as it puts quarrying on an equal footing and therefore in competition with food growing and horticulture for use of that land. Quarrying is shown as being viable on non-HPL. Food growers do not have the luxury of being able to use less productive land. If they do, it comes at cost because of the management involved and also the other products they need to actually get that growth. It increases costs as well. The Land Inventory and the CRC website and the forthcoming NPS all cite LUC 1 to 3 land as being highly productive. Quarrying is a one-off use. Once a hectare of aggregate is removed, it does not grow back, but horticulture is sustainable year on year. 
An industry expert at consent hearing in 2019 also stated LUC 1 to 3 was classified accordingly. Therefore, the district plan should incorporate LUC 1 to 3 also and not risk the productive capability through the permitting of incompatible land use that does not have a proven record of fully restoring land to the state it was prior to operations or better. And I've just evidenced that through the recent one through the slides for you. This has been the current requirement under the current district plan with regards to versatile soils. As stated, next year a high bar is going to be set to ensure the environment is protected with requirements to consider the precautionary principle margins of safety and environmental bottom lines. Operators have been clear through their own reporting that consent hearings post quarry use land is viable for light pastoral use or grazing and supports the growing of grasses, but it's not suitable for commercial food growing. The standard rehabilitation used in this region comprises of 30 centimetres of topsoil and grass over either clean fill if available or over one metre of undisturbed gravel or material. And the new owner of this site you've been seeing the slides from, she advises the operator claim to have used 60 centimetres of topsoil. So if that is the case, that too shows land is unusable just 12 months after rehabilitation. This will be discussed at the more appropriate hearing next year, but I'm prepared to bring evidence from the industry's own reporting if that is needed. Chapters 5 and 15 of the RPS cover this issue of soils in detail, and anything that takes this valuable soil out of long-term or permanent use, or causes adverse effects on the health of the soil, or results in the removal of such soil, etc., contravenes the regional policy statement and also the current district plan. In addition to reducing the productive capability of the land for reasons already mentioned, including the significantly reduced depth of soil, eventual washing through of the minimal layer we've just seen, it's acknowledged in the CCC report regarding rehabilitation that the storing of the soil over a period of several years, such as in buns, does indeed reduce the health of the soil. The longer it's stored, the more significant the impact accordingly. And I'm not reporting this as an expert. I appreciate I'm not. I'm reporting what was in the Christchurch City Council's own rehabilitation document. It can be reversed, but it takes time and careful management. So if consideration is given to the industry's request, it's important a hierarchical order is stipulated with horticulture and food growers being prioritised. With consents not being considered if non-HPL is available in this region. Transport costs should not be considered as a viable reason to allow inappropriate one-off use such as valuable, of such valuable land. If food growers have to move further afield because the land they need is being misused, causing them to move further away, this will result in increased costs for them. That will no doubt end up being passed to the consumers. And just to show you and explain this slide, such non-LUC 1 to 3 land is most certainly available in abundance in this region and has been identified as suitable land by the industry itself through a consent hearing from 2019. What I've done here is I've actually taken the image this um, operator produced at the hearing from last year and I've overlaid it with Canterbury maps which shows the LUC 1 to 3 soil availability in this region. So just to show you there, you can see the key, um, the dark green areas would be LUC1 land, the mid green LUC2 and the light green LUC3. So where you have got the cream coloured areas or not green, that is not one to three land that is available. The majority of the land in Selwyn is non LUC1 to three, which could be used by the industry. Yes, it may be a few kilometres further away from Christchurch, but with Selwyn growing, I'm sure, you know, any aggregate from this region would be used in this area in the going into the future. So those increased transport costs wouldn't necessarily be relevant. So please, can I just, with this image, please ask that um, it's not given the same classification as being highly productive where it is in com competition with food growers. There is a lot of land that can be used, which is non LUC one to three. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, reading through that. We we had read that, but that's okay. So I'll just see if we have questions for you, Gary. Oh, no, thank you. All right, one. No. No, no, questions. No, no, no. And look, I have no questions either for you. Um, that just means that the presentation, the material you've provided to us is crystal clear. So there's nothing we need to clarify with you. So that's good. You should feel pleased about that. And other than that, thank you very much for coming in and presenting to us this morning. Thank you. 
I'll be seeing you a few times, I think. That's right. <laughs> I can't hear you. <laughs> Oh, so they're not there yet? They're on that other side. Okay. All right, well, we'll take our, our next matter, Ellesmere Sustainable Agriculture. Do you want to come on up? We'll hear you now, if that's okay. Oh, hang on. She's in the waiting room. Oh, hang on. If you have for me to right. admit her. Yeah, yeah. So we can hear from federated farmers then. Yeah. Um, that's So, good morning. Can you hear us? Nope. I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning and welcome. So thank you very much for um, presenting uh, the pre-circulated material, which we've read, so you don't need to read that out loud to us, uh, as with the previous hearing that you've appeared um, in. But you're very welcome to run through and highlight your key points for us, and then we'll see if we have any questions for you. Thank you. Okay. Um, apologies for lateness. I, I had a meeting um, invite that was actually at 11 o'clock. So, um, So can you still hear us? Oh, I'm sorry. I just realized that I had my YouTube on listening and now it's playing back on me. Okay, I'll switch that off. <laughs> so I got a bit confused about why I was being repeated. Hang on a second. I just seem to have lost the screen. Sorry, thank you for your patience. It's all right. Tēnā koutou katoa. I'm Alicia Young Ebert, Senior Policy Advisor for Federated Farmers, and I thank you for this opportunity to present on the Federation Submission Points Part 1 of the proposed Selwyn District Plan. Federated Farmers is an advocacy group that aims to enable our members to thrive on their farms across New Zealand. We have a strong membership base in Selwyn and their farming operations are as diverse as the land types in this large district. Our members have a great interest in this PP PDP because this plan will inform and direct how they can use and develop their land for the next 10 years. My hearing statement responded to the recommendations the Section 42A reporter gave on our submission points. I am open to discuss the content of my hearing statement with the commissioners but I would like at this hearing to concentrate my speech on how this PDP will enable a Taumutu Runanga and Tainai to Ahuriri 
Rūnanga to perform their roles as tangata whenua over the salmon district. Specifically, HPW 10, which provides some general guidance on consultation, and MANA 3, where we ask for some amendments to the narratives set out in the Tangata Whenua MANA Whenua chapter of the PDP. Federated farmers had suggested a link between HPW 10, which encourages plan users to consult with IWI before proceeding with an application, to the Tangata Whenua chapter of the plan. I agree with the Section 42A reporter that HPW 10 is not the place to include information about how to consult with IWI. What the Federation had asked for was more information in the Tangata Whenua chapter about consultation with IWI, and HPW 10 would have a link to the relevant provisions. We ask for this because anyone who reads HPW 10 may not know why it is important to consult with IWI and how. I note the panel had asked the council about the section 42A report's recommendation not to include more information in this provision of the plan. The section 42A report had identified that the council does include a PDF copy of consultation guidelines developed by Environment Canterbury. With some of the information and the pamphlet is useful, it is not targeted activities that may require consent under the Selwyn district plan. May I also point out that ECAN has its own dedicated web page with general information on how to consult with IWI. I do hope the Council is willing to do more to facilitate positive working relationships between landowners and the Tūrūnunga who hold mana whenua in this district. I recommend the Council develop a dedicated web page to inform and guide applicants, which can then be added as a simple note in HPW 10, directing plan users to that web page. For more information. We asked for changes to the phrasing of two paragraphs in one or three. In the third paragraph, we sought for the sentence that described the effect that land users has had on water quality, mahinga kai sites, and the cultural values of sites such as Te Waihora and Muriwai. We recommended the word harm be replaced with impact and limit with may affect. We sought these changes because the phrasing seemed to imply that all land users, users by their nature, harm water quality and other cultural values. We believe these changes would offer a balance of positive impacts from land use alongside practices that have had negative effects on Tangata Whenua's ability to connect to and to exercise Kakia Putanga over the land and water in the district. The Section 42A reporter had initially recommended our suggested word change to proceed, but she did decide to retain the reading as notified following questions from the panel. I have gone back to the specific section of the plan and looked at the wider context of that paragraph. The preceding sentence spoke of land use in past tense. For example, land users have affected water quality in my hanger kai and have increased their threat to areas of cultural value. I think correspondingly, the following sentence, which we ask for changes to, should also be in the past tense. I also think the use of the phrase, the effects of the start of that sentence, is a touch ambiguous. It is unclear if the council means the effect of the land use or the consequent effect on water quality and so on. I would like to suggest the council instead adopts the following sentence phrasing. I will uh, send this to the council so that you can review it in writing. The effects of certain land users have also harmed the relationship local iwi have with, with the land, wahitapu, and other wahitawana sites, and have limited the ability of Māori to engage in the traditional practice of kaitikiakitanga. I consider these slight changes to the phrasing would assist land users to understand the challenges and the barriers Māori have had to face and continue to face. It also helps to set a context as to why the PDP has suggested provisions throughout the plan on certain land uses, like earthquakes, to ensure that going forward, IWI will have opportunities to be consulted and to connect with specific places and resources they value and cherish. I have also revisited the final paragraph of minor trade. And after some thought, I would like to suggest some changes to clarify the narratives in this paragraph. I understand the council is saying the district is rich in cultural sites and values, and all these sites and areas are held in high esteem by all. 
In order to ensure these sites receive appropriate attention and protection, IWI does collaborate and work alongside the council and other groups in the district to restore or enhance these areas. I think the sentence in this final paragraph could be redrafted to better reflect this intent. And I would suggest the following phrasing, as a whole, this is, the Selwyn district is rich in places of cultural significance, making a kai and ancestral values, and all these places are held in high esteem, full stop. Iwi, regulatory authorities and local interest groups work together through close cultural relationships to facilitate the kaitiakitanga of these sites. Nahini. Commissioners, your questions, please. Thank you very much for that, and we do appreciate that um, you've suggested some um, revised specific wording, and you're going to send that into our hearing secretary, so that would be good. Thank you very much for that. I'll just see if we have questions for you. Nothing, any questions? No, I'm very interested in your revised wording, and I'll be interested to see what our officers' comments are on that. Thank you. Yeah, um, if I may say, it's not, I'm not moving the substance. I think it's the, it's sometimes, um, words, the translation of what you intend doesn't always come through. And so it's just a suggestion around reconfiguring the structure of the sentences that, so that it just, so when someone reads it, they really come to grips with what's really going on. Um, and so it's just very slight tweaks, but I don't think we are seeking to change the intent of what these messages are coming through in the plan. Yes, I just had one question, please, about the maintenance and repair definition. I'm not sure if you've touched on that today, but yeah, just in, in a nutshell, um, Federated Farmers is, is keen not to include, um, sorry, is, is, is interested to include the words or increase in voltage as an exclusion, um, because you've said that that has an impact on buffer separation distances and the like for farming. Um, did you want to address us on that? My particular question was um, whether the increase in voltage would normally be covered by um, by the national policy statement for electricity transmission, for instance. That I think that's the evidence we're going to hear from some other submitters. So I'm interested to know whether you've had a look at that and whether you think um, the national policy statement would require us to include an increase in voltage as maintenance and repair. Uh, I'm not, it's, uh, it's the national policy statement for electricity emissions as, as transmission is not actually um, an area I am very familiar with. It was just something uh, we generally supported hot and Z on, um, but we do understand widely some of the impacts okay. having um, some of that electricity transmission going through private property will have effect on farmers. I think in, in the actual hearing statement that I wrote, we actually raised the NZ ECP code of practice for um, safe distances. Uh, and I think the increase in voltage, yes, it would, would mean that activities around it would have to change and that in, in turn might affect how, where farmers perhaps put their stock or where they put their shed. Um, but that's, I think that's probably what they're saying. I um, just to say, not to say that it's a it's a straight committed, possibly a controlled activity. Just to have some consideration around where the proposed, you know, the, that the voltage increase would have some consideration on the impact on the property. Yeah. Yes, thank you for that. Yes, I think Ms. Wolf um, addresses that issue too. I'll yes. ask you some questions <laughs> on that too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yes, I was interested to hear about your your um, comments to the Section 42A report about the Mana Whenua chapter, and I agree that um, your um, amended wording would be great. It's just a pity that nobody asked for um, that for a sentence that requested the contemporary relationship. That, exp well, ex that explains how land use practices of today are improving um, mm. things for mana whenua, but, um, but that wasn't asked for. So I think your 
amended wording would be great. Um, I just have one question, and it's to do with HPW7, how the plan works. In your submission dated 11th of December 2020, in the table under HPW7, you refer to resource consents and note the evolution of FEP with regard to water management, Mahingakai and Indigenous biodiversity. How would Federated Farmers view the inclusion of mitigation to recognise and acknowledge the edge effect as described in the forest and bird submission to evolve farm environment plans even more? Uh, I haven't read the, the forest and bird submission specifically. Um, it's just, yeah, I haven't had a lot of time to do that. But I think in principle, one of the things that the, the Federation generally struggles with is when you have duplication of considerations at, at two different councils for a landowner. And I think if they, and that's where the question around better integration for information and assessments is, is a good principle to have. And so if the suggestion is that we, we look at, um, at implementation side more closely at where some of those assessments will overlap and we can bring them into a more integrated approach that would be useful, uh, particularly for things like biodiversity. Um, and I do understand that, you know, for the draft NPS, that was the suggestion uh, and that probably is why there was a far more requirement for better information sharing between the regional council and the district council. Um, no, I don't, I, I think in principle, I've, I've always felt that if, um, if we could avoid having a landowner having to reply, uh, you know, having their assessment done twice over in many ways, that would be a much more efficient use of time and expense for everybody. Um, it, it, even even for um, iwi, because if they had to come, you know, if they're being consulted at two different stages and they cons they have to assess the application twice as well, that's that's time they'll need to use yeah. on their side. Um, I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if I may add, Commissioner uh, Solomon, uh, to your point around. The, um, thank you for uh, agreeing with the suggestion of reading. I think I, I would have liked to go on further in the way that you asked and was to say that would there have been a better way of having a sentence in there that talks about the aspirations for Iwi in terms of the contemporary outlook and, and objectives. If, you know, uh, in turn, like a lot of the community uh, projects are ongoing at the moment. These are positive things going forward yeah. that, you know, just a more, another sentence around where EWI wants to go um, around. The, it's, it's just yeah. a pity that no submission requested that because we haven't got the scope yeah. to do it. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> thank you. No further questions from me, but thanks very much for zooming in this morning. Thank you, Commissioners. I will um, send my hearing. Uh, my speech notes to the council. Okay, thank you. Yep. Right, our next submitter, Ellesmere Sustainable Agriculture. Come on up. Right, good morning and welcome over to you. I think you know the drill. You don't need to read out the pre-circulated material, but you're very, uh, we'd like to give you tabled material today to read that out to us and then um, we'll see if we have questions after that. Thank you. Sorry, is that? 
working? Yeah. Okay, tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. Hello, everybody, and warm greetings to you. I'm Kerry Barnett, the Environmental Advisor for Ellesmere Sustainable Agriculture Incorporated, and thank you again for the opportunity to speak today and answer any questions you have. Ellesmere Sustainable Agriculture at Hearing One set out the group's history and interest in participating in the cell and district plan process. And I just direct you back to our original submission and information that was lodged with our introductory statements. As previously stated, ESI works closely with the Council, ECAN, the Department of Conservation, the Ministries for Primary Industries and the Environment, Te Tamutu, Runaka, and a variety of other interest groups, including local schools and the community, to what we hope to achieve are excellent environmental outcomes for Ellesmere. ESI stresses the importance and success of non-regulatory activity and proactive consultation in supporting and improving environmental and farming results. This is why ESI has submitted on this section of the plan, and in particular, the Tangata Whenua, Manu Whenua section. These submissions are intended to further clarify how the provision, provisions may work in practice and to strengthen relationships between the Council, iwi, and the many interested parties. ESI wishes to respectfully and genuinely convey that our submissions are in no way intended to be culturally insensitive. As background information, ESI has been proactive in trying to consult with iwi over the proposed provisions in the district plan. Early in the process, but after the Council had worked substantially with Mahanui Kuratayao Limited, MKT, in the drafting phase, ESO recognised that it would be beneficial for all parties to come together and discuss the proposed wording of the provisions and relevant parts of the plan before notification. E so I approached MKT but obtained no response and at that time also tried to consult directly with Te Tamutu Runaka representatives. Council staff also saw value in the three parties coming together and a hui was arranged. Unfortunately, MKT cancelled this meeting four days before it was to occur and did not offer rescheduling. Unfortunately, after this, no opportunity arose to further meet. And it wasn't assisted, of course, by the, the plan being notified and then the arrival of COVID-19. I am pleased to report, though, that through ESI's Tanaku project and the Whakakohanga Korero Forum, we have been able to actively engage with Titamu to Runaka. To date, though, this has not extended to talking directly with MKT about planning provisions. It is ESI's view that it is absolutely essential that landowners, regulatory authorities, iwi and land managers work together to create improved environmental outcomes for all. And while we respect the relationships that councils have with iwi, ESI believes this is not at the exclusion of those entities or individuals who are significantly affected by policy and provisions that emanate from such relationships. Ideally, and as was instigated by ESI, discussing the proposed provisions and draft phase may have resulted in the matters that we have suggested need further amendment being resolved to meet all our needs prior to the notification of the provisions. And ESI would much rather offer submissions in support of provisions at this stage of the planning process. ESI actually finds it uncomfortable to be submitting on the Tangata Whenua, Manu Whenua provisions without having had the benefit of talking directly with MKT representatives, especially since we believe the desires for environmental improvement in Ellesmere and Selwyn are very much aligned to the outcomes also sought by iwi. If I could just direct you here to the last page of um, the hard copy I've given you. This is just an example of where we see our group and how it would like to um, consult and be part of the picture for planning provisions 
uh, with iwi and regulatory authorities. So the first slide is, um, it comes from a presentation we did to our own group on our strategic direction for Ellesmere Sustainable Agriculture. And it shows um, where we thought we sat at that time, which was the end of 2018. So we, we could see there was a rural disconnect but that we're actually all trying to achieve the same thing. And you can see we've got those um, statutory plans, et cetera, placed nicely in between where we think we want things to go. So the, the next slide that we brought up at our strategy day was so what, we, what do we want to actually achieve in the RMA, RMA space? And it clearly shows that our group and with EWI see that we have some really genuine and similar concerns for the environment. And we see that it would be most beneficial for those groups to talk and consult and get together and then help inform the regulations that stem from there and ultimately at the bottom coming out with some really good farming and environmental outcomes. So that was just to give you an example really of how we would like things to work in practice. Um, so in conclusion, I've also read the statement of Federated Farmers and looked at their further suggested amendments. So we've come to an agreement that we both share the same wording for the adjustments suggested by Alicia just now for MANA 3. So the, the two suggested changes I've shown um, in the next page in Annex 1. So the third paragraph of MANA 3 and the fifth paragraph of MANA 3 um, is our shared agreed approach with regard to that, which is slightly different to what we have previously had in our statements. So if I just skip to the penultimate paragraph of our evidence here, um, we believe that the requests made to amend these provisions are entirely constructive, positive, and do not seek to minimise or erode the importance of this chapter to the plan, the council, or iwi. They simply serve to further strengthen the important relationships we must all foster to create the outcomes we all desire for our environment. If I just shoot across to um, Annex 1 again and look at MANA 7 and MANA 8. So since our lodgement of our statement on the 8th of August, there's been a time delay and we've managed to work through some more thinking around those provisions. So in terms of MANA 7, our concern there is not in relation to either stating the agreements that are listed in the plan as it reads at the moment, nor what the content is. It's really just around how that's actually placed in an electronic plan. So we've offered two options, either that it's say at the time of the plan becoming operative, there are these agreements in place, and that rather than stating them specifically, they are just contained in a link where you can go directly to those documents. Now, reasoning for that is that those documents are very active. Several of them have been reviewed many times during um, the current district plan. So we see it as um, being actually helpful to the operation of the plan to have a direct link to the latest current document with regard to those two. Um, our second alternative there is that it, um, relate more perhaps to what is already written in the plan, but instead of having the two agreements listed, that it just relate to inserting a link there. We actually see that as being more flexible to the council and any plan users and those people subject to the agreement. And lastly, MANA 8 is very similar to the uh, changes that Federated Farmers came to in their statement, but with one alteration in the second to last line, and that we would desire that the council engages with regard to land and water use activities and community projects, whereas Federated Farmers has just related that to community projects. 
we think there's a bigger picture there rather than just community projects and that it relates quite specifically more to, in our case, farming operations. And just as one last point in relation to Commissioner Solomon's um, concern over the non-request for contemporary inclusion <laughs> statements. Um, yes, we feel that pain probably now in hindsight, but I guess there was a nervousness around having not discussed the information with MKT that it got missed. So thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Right, thanks very much for that and for providing the uh, written material and the specific amendments that you now seek in terms of your original submission. Any questions? Yes, I'm interested in your agreement on the wording. I'm just, um, you talk about ESI and you talk about other other entities with interest in Te Waiwara and the catchment. Um, I'm just sort of wondering, is ESI trying to um, rank themselves in precedence over those other entities? Uh, uh, I'm aware that there are others and there will be more to come in the future. So I'm just wondering where you see ESI sitting there. No, our desire is not to outrank anyone, but rather it's just to be one of the voices heard amongst all the others. So we know there is a huge number of interested parties in, and around the lake. So the recent forum that we've been involved with through changes to the TY Hora governance ag agreement, um, is probably the most worthwhile biggest step that we've taken recently and to hear from those other groups and it's working really well and we can't support that particular forum enough. So certainly we, our aim is not to outrank. Thank you, that's very pleasing to hear. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Right, thanks very much for that. Um, no further questions from me, but I understand the points you're making um, regarding the um, shelf life of documents that are referred to in a district plan. And I do note that in the e plan, MANA 8 has some hyperlinks um, to iwi management plans, etc. So that would I assume take you through to whatever the latest version is. So I certainly understand those issues and look forward to hearing what the officers advise us in that regard in their reply report, which we'll receive in due course. But thanks very much for coming in. Thank you. Now the next uh, submitter on our list is John Ferguson. I have no pre circulated stuff. Yep, thank you. Um, Thanks, John. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go through this. So, Mr. Ferguson, I think this is the um, first time we've seen you in these um, hearings, so just but to let you know our approach is that um, we thank people for putting in their original submissions so they don't need to be read out loud to us and if material has been pre-circulated then that doesn't need to be read out either but if you've tabled extra material like you have done today we prefer for you just to read that through to us if that's okay with you and then we'll see if we have questions after that all right it's it's not even going to be as long as it looks because there's a few examples on page two uh i originally made a submission on the PDSP identifying that throughout the plan, the noun setback has been used in place of the verb usage of that word, which is set space back. However, despite my submission being a matter of fact, as opposed to my opinion, my submission was not accepted by council and I wish to briefly discuss why it should be reconsidered. Uh, I'll assume that everyone has read the council reply, but I don't mind reading it out. So I disagree with the officer's assertion that the PDP uses setback where the definition applies and uses set space back when advising users how far something should be located. In fact, with the odd exception, which I provide, the district plan does not use it correctly at all. Although I acknowledge that this is somewhat of a trope in planning hearings, I nevertheless refer to the Oxford English Dictionary to support my submission. The OED classifies the word setback as a noun. Uh, and then it goes on to define it, which you can read there. And my example of the word being used as a noun is in the sentence, the building has a setback of five meters to the road. The OED goes on to state that the verbal phrase is set back. And in this case, verbal means relating to or derived from a verb. My example of the words being used as a verbal phrase is in the sentence, the building is required to be set back five meters from the road. The word setback as it relates to setting back from a boundary originated as a noun about a century ago uh, follow, in Massachusetts, followed by subsequent recorded usage of the word and publications from Chicago, Baltimore and Virginia. A hundred years later, this Americanism is now in common usage as a noun in the planning and architectural professions of New Zealand, if not the world. The phrase set back consists of two words, set, a verb, and back, an adverb. There are a lot of definitions for set, but with regard to this context, it conveys the meanings to put in a definite place, the manner of the action being implied either in the verb itself or in the context, to place or cause to be in a position, condition, relation or connection, and this group embraces a large number of uses in which the precise implication of sense depends mainly on the kind of construction employed. All of these italicized bits are from the OED. Back is an adverb in this usage and means at a distance away. And so when used together, the phrase set back is to be placed at a distance away. I believe that this can be treated as a procedural amendment and as clause 16.2 of the RMA allows a local authority to make an amendment to a proposed plan without using a schedule one process where such an alteration is of minor effect or may correct any minor errors. 
There are no implications on any person as a result of the amendment I'm proposing. I've provided some examples. Uh, the number of actual examples is high and therefore, therefore I do not wish to waste anyone's time going through them all. However, I'd be help, happy to help out if Council would like them all found and created. All right, thank you very much for that. And I think the examples you provided in, on the handout give us a good illustration of the point you're making. So it's, um, it's easy to see when we look at those examples, the point you're making. So I certainly understand that now. And I'll just see if we have any questions for you, Gary. Yes, thank, thank you for that. Um, I was going to rather flippantly ask you um, if you're right, and, and it seems quite a powerful argument you present. Um, why are you so excited about it? <laughs> uh, I, because, because I feel that it will, I don't know, you may as well spell something wrong all the way through the district plan. You know, like this is just, these are just facts. And it's the, the assertion that it's being used with reference to a definition. Like, it's good if you were using it right, but it's not. And there are examples in the district plan of where it has been used correctly. So I know that there is it's chopping and changing, but. So, yeah. so where, where you say that there's no implications on any person, are there any implications on the rules or um, is it purely a, a grammatical um, thing you'd like to see put right? It has no implications on the rule structures or anything else. Is, is that That's what it right. It's to? grammatical pedantry. Yeah. Right. Okay. However, yeah. you know, you may as well use the word wheelbarrow in the middle of it because it's the wrong word. Thank you. <laughs> thanks very much. I fear the questions from me either, but again, thanks for providing those, uh, those working examples of, to illustrate the point. Cheers. Thank you. Mr. Ensor. I think you've appeared before us before, so I don't need to outline the drill to you, but uh, good morning and welcome. Sure, so. um, I just thought I'd highlight a, a couple of the main points um, and, and then I'm happy to take any questions. Um, the first, points are in, uh, first point is in relation to uh, definitions that, that sit within the definition standard um, and you know I, I acknowledge that they, they cannot be changed and um, you know the officers made the right recommendation with regards to those definitions um, but I do just want to highlight that careful consideration needs to be given to how these definitions are then going to be applied through the remainder of the plan um, particularly in, in relation to the relevant rules um, and I guess it's because of the, the language that has been used in those or the, or the terms that have been used within some of those definitions um, and some inconsistencies, I suppose, that then, then pop out. And I've cited a couple of examples there, rural industry being one and how that relates to um, primary production, for example. Um, and, and, and then another one around um, quarrying activities uh, clean filling and clean fill material, which we heard a little bit about this morning. Um, and, and that there is really about maximising the potential rehabilitation. It's um, not, as uh, was suggested this morning, accessing uh, contaminated material to put in the ground. Um, uh, the, the intention would be that, um, that it would align with what happens in Christchurch district plan where there's, there's inert material used. So really crushed concrete is a, is a prime example. Um, not only does that maximize rehabilitation, but it also maximizes the waste minimization component, which is also something that sort of gets a little tripped up um, by the use of these definitions. So there'll be um, a little bit more discussion about that um, as we move into the, the relevant rules in the rural chapter probably. Um, the other point is, is really around the definition of sensitive activity. Um, um, I view the, the notified definition um, is appropriate in its inclusion of residential activities. Um, residential activities uh, deserve and, and would expect a, a reasonable level of amenity. Um, and from, I guess, Fulton Hogan's perspective, it's, it's really quite important um, that residential activities remains in that definition from a reverse sensitivity perspective. Um, so really, uh, those, are the, those are the key points. I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. 
No, that's very good. Thank you. And I certainly note the point that um, you'll come back to address this in a more substantive manner in, in future hearings, but it's useful to have this drawn to our attention now. See if we have questions for you, Gary. I just endorse, I just endorse what the chair just said. Yeah, I think it's summarised in your paragraph 26 that um, um, it's how the rules work um, that, that, that give that implement the definitions, really, isn't it? So yes, that's you'll right. be coming back to us on those things. Yeah, we'll be here. Yeah, thank you. And as you might have anticipated, no further questions from me, but thanks very much for coming in this very morning. Very good. Well, thanks very much for your time. So we're now adjourned until 1.30. What? Pardon? Long lunch. Long lunch, yeah.
Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's close enough to 1.30 that we'll get underway. And are we still having Department of Corrections as our first submitter? Okay. Just while we're waiting, who are you? <laughs> okay, cool. We'll just try and get. Uh... Okay, we we'll just... Yep, we'll see how we get on. Sorry, what was that email? I couldn't hear. Mr. Dow, do you think we could proceed with you and then if Ms. Harrell can join us, is, was she going to say anything or just, uh, not really, just, just listen? Yeah, happy okay, yeah. so you're happy if we just go ahead with you? Yeah. All right. Yep, well, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, thank you very much for um, lodging the um, pre-circulated evidence, which you've read, so you don't need to read that out to us. 
but you're very welcome to highlight key points um, that you wish us to take on board, and then we'll see if we have any questions for you, if that's okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, I do have a brief summary which I'll uh, read out. Um, so, out of Potama, the Department of Corrections made submissions on the proposed solemn plan definitions of community corrections activity and corrections, corrections activity. Uh, the definition of community corrections activity captures non custodial activities such as service centres and community work facilities operated by the department. The definition is consistent with the equivalent definition in the national planning standards and the department supports the retention of the definition consistent with the section 42a report recommendations. The separate definition of corrections activity captures both non custodial correction community corrections activity and custodial activities such as prisons and detention centres. The department does not support the retention of the definition of corrections activity and requests that it be deleted. The definition of correction act, corrections activity is applied in the neighbourhood centre zone, local centre zone, large format retail zone, town centre zone and general industrial zone. The intention of the definition and associated roles is to make non-custodial community corrections activity a permitted activity in those zones and custodial activities such as prisons a non-complying activity. I support that intent, however, I consider the mechanics of how the definition of corrections activity and the rules work together to make community corrections activities permitted and custodial activities non-complying is unwieldy and lacks clarity. And this primarily stems from the definition of corrections activity confusingly capturing both community corrections activity and custodial activities such as prisons in the same definition. This results in a convoluted pathway to determining the permitted or non-complying status of each activity. I consider the deletion of the definition of corrections activity and the addition of new or amended rules that make a corrections prison, as defined in section three of the Corrections Act, a non-complying activity in those commercial zones would result in a more simplistic, effective and efficient approach that would achieve the same outcome sought by the council. Consequential changes to the wording of rules to achieve this approach uh, will be addressed in the department's evidence on later hearing topics. If it answers any questions. Great, thank you very much for that. And would you mind providing a copy of the speaking notes to our hearing secretary so we can have, a, have that for the record? Okay, I'll just see if we have any questions for you, Malcolm. Any questions? Gary? No, I think I took the message to be that um, the solution in your mind is to is to do is to delete one definition and then deal with the with, in the rules, which we'll consider at a later hearing. So it's sort of like a package that you're presenting, isn't it? A, a solution that comprises definitions and rules together. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, I mean, essentially. We're trying to seek, seek the same outcome as the council. It's just a different mechanism to achieve that. So, just finally, I'd, I'd be interested to hear the response from the officer in due course on that, whether there's a way forward that has commonality on it. So, thank you. Raymond, any questions? <clears throat> Mr. Dale, no questions for me. When I read through the material, I thought this is confusing all these different definitions and trying to figure out what was what and where it all went. But then when I got to your paragraph 16.7, oh, 6.17 to 6.20, I thought, oh, well, there's an elegant solution for us. So um, echo my fellow commissioners' comments. Look forward to seeing that addressed in the reply report. But thank you for providing what seems like a sensible way for a sort of reasonably complicated definitional issue. So thank you. Okay, our next submitter is Orion. Orion team, come on up. Thank you, yes. Yep. Now, I don't know, try pushing both of them a little. There you go. When the little red light's on, you're all good.
So um, thank you very much for coming in and providing the pre-circulated evidence, which we've read. And I see you've tabled some uh, additional material. So if you're happy just to read that out to us, that would be great. And then we'll see if we have questions for you. Is that okay? Absolutely. Great, thanks. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Melanie Karen Quick. I'm a senior consultant with Resource Management Group here in Christchurch. I've provided a brief uh, planning evidence. And I note for this hearing, uh, we've only presented uh, planning evidence However, I do have Mr. Hayes from Orion and Ms. Hill from Chapman Trip. Should you have any questions uh, for those people? Thank you. Orion supported the notified defect. Oh, sorry, backtrack. I Orion agreed with uh, Council's position all apart from one definition relating to the definition of maintenance and repair. We supported this definition subject to some recommended changes uh, just to increase clarity. Uh, Ms. Tualepa recommended accepting the proposed amendments in part, however, has rejected including the proposed addition of the following, uh, the term upgrading, emergency works and testing of equipment. With respect to the term upgrade, this is critical to Orion and comprises 95% of its work program and the inclusion of this word, uh, word better reflects the actual reality of how electricity distribution infrastructure and equipment are managed and developed over time. At paragraphs 21.1 to 21.6 of my evidence filed, I list some examples of some of Orion's works that are undertaken as part of their maintenance program, but might also uh, these items listed could also be considered as minor upgrades to their network. This really depends on the perspective of different plan users. In my view, the ultimate functionality of the network remains such that these work that works and these examples are considered to be maintaining the network. It's important to note that minor upgrade works anticipated under this defi definition would not include any substantive expansion of any existing line with new spans or increasing the voltage and would not include buildings, structures, facilities, or any other utility that would increase the existing footprint, height, or external envelope as per the def definition proposed by Ms. Tualipa. In my view, this provision is limiting the scale of the upgrade and maintenance works, thus alleviating Ms. Tualipa's concerns. To provide, provide more clarity, on the word upgrade, I propose a further amendment to the definition of maintenance repair with the addition of the word minor. I have reviewed the evidence of Ms. Young Ebert for Federated Farmers of New Zealand and that of Ms. Wharf for Horticulture New Zealand. Both experts recommend that or increase in voltage is added to the definition. I agree with this additional wording as any increase in voltage would need to be considered under EI Chapter Rule 11, upgrading the existing above ground utilities. With respect to the other two additions, I recommended that being emergency works and testing of equipment. I note Ms. Tualepa did not provide any reasons for not including these as part of the amended definition. Both the testing of equipment and the ability to undertake emergency works are, an important, are both important components of Orion's repair and maintenance functions, and I consider need to be included. Further on the addition of uh, emergency works, I do note that under section 330 of the RMA, which relates to emergency works and the power to take preventative action, Orion can undertake such works. However, I'm aware of instances around the country where councils have challenged this, where emergency works, for instance, may have ongoing adverse effects, and in some instances have required retrospective consents to be obtained. In my view, by including the term emergency works in this definition, it's simply removing any uncertainty uh, that may potentially arise. Based on my view for the need for more clarity, in my agreement with Ms. Young Ebert and Ms. Wharf, I propose the definition of maintenance and repair be amended further 
as follows um, where I've marked bold and underlined. So you'll see I've added the word minor as I alluded to before. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you for listening. No, thank you for that. We'll see, we do have questions, Gary. Any questions? Uh, yes, thank, thank you, Ms. Foot. Um, can you help me understand how the national policy statement for MSET uh, electricity transmission is relevant at all to this discussion? Um, I understood from some evidence that's been given that um, that would um, require us to provide for upgrading, which includes potentially increasing the voltage. Um, is that your understanding? Well, that doesn't apply to us because we don't come under that NPS. So um, I think it's a completely separate issue. You don't come They've under got the their own rules okay. in the plan. Um, so. All right, no, that, that answers yeah. it. <laughs> Raymond, any questions? I beg your pardon, was that paragraph 23? I didn't quite hear you. Oh, sorry. Sorry, have I made myself understandable? So I'll just have a quick reread. Okay. Give me one moment, please. So what I'm trying to say here is, um, so Orion operates across uh, different districts and what we're really hoping for is that we have some consistency uh, across uh, those operational areas and amongst, and we operate, or Orion, sorry, operates under different plans. Uh, so achieving some consistency goes a long way to helping Orion in the carrying out the, their roles as infrastructure provider and and actually, I think I've misunderstood. It's all right. Okay, sure, that's fine. Yeah. No worries. <clears throat> I think the um, point Commissioner Solomon was raising is that perhaps we should delete the word not out of the last line in Para 23. Is that perhaps correct? As I read that yeah. for the 10th time, yeah, perhaps. <laughs> just take the word not out, I think. Yeah. Raymond, anything else? No, I think that's well, thanks um, for a couple of things. Firstly, for um, referring to the submissions of Port New Zealand, et cetera, and for advising us that Orion is comfortable with their suggestion, that's helpful. In, in terms of the um, track changes you've attached there, um, testing of equipment and minor upgrade, I can understand the rationale behind that. Just with emergency works, I um, just want to ask you a little bit more about that. I mean, because as you mentioned, Section 330 does provide for emergency works to be undertaken. But importantly, in my view, where those um, emergency works have ongoing adverse effects, then consent is required, which seems highly appropriate to me. So why should we enable emergency works to be authorised cut launch if in some cases they might have ongoing adverse effects? I guess that was quite a generalist comment. I think the range, emergency works is a difficult term because it encompasses uh, wide-ranging activities with wide-ranging effects to, to smaller effects. What we're trying to do here is just remove any uncertainty around that uh, by including that in there. What's the implication of that? Does that then roll emergency works into permitted activity rules? Just to backtrack there a little bit, sorry. In terms of Orion's function as a lifeline utility, um, the ability to carry out emergency works um, is really important. At the end of the day, yeah. you want the lights on, you want your power on. So uh, to, I think for Orion, perhaps my wording in there in terms of ongoing adverse effects probably wasn't the right wording to use because Orion tend to have more short term uh, works associated with the emergencies, because obviously you want to get the power back on, it's not going to last a year in terms of <laughs> the yeah. works that they're undertaking. So 
Yeah, I guess the point I'm, I'm trying to... I'm happy for Mr Hayes to just elaborate. Yeah, happy for the rest of the team to jump in just to assist me. I mean, the point I'm trying to make is that the Act provides for emergency works to be undertaken. So you don't need any rules in a plan to enable that. But the Act also provides under Section 330, capital A, subsection 2, that if those emergency works have ongoing adverse effects, then consent should be sought for those activities. And that seems appropriate to me. I don't understand why... Correct, it does, yes. I don't understand why we should negate that provision that's in the statute. I wasn't asking for it to be negated per se. I just think some councils do tend to get a bit confused um, around... Uh, around that, and there has been some instances where had to get consent where um, wouldn't shouldn't be needed. Yep. So it's really just trying to just uh, remove any uncertainty um, and just make it clear. Yeah, well, that's why I asked the question: Does this then affect any permitted activity rules? Would then emergency works become a permitted activity regardless of the scale of their effects? I need to have a closer look at that um, yeah. and happy to answer that. On, we're going to thrash this out on Thursday. Yeah. Perhaps a bit more. Yeah, well, it's, it's good that we, yeah. we will discuss that further. Yeah. So I guess yeah, my concern is that I'm not seeing a good reason why we should um, override the provisions in the Act that relate to emergency works at this stage. Yeah, I can understand. Yeah. yeah. I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. And I'm not asking you to shouldn't be overriding what the X says, obviously. Yeah. But we just want to remove any uncertainty for Orion. So Yeah, I understand why Orion might want to do that, but I'm more concerned about if emergency works have ongoing adverse effects, then they shouldn't be permitted. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All right, well if you were to come back to that yeah. later in the week, that would be helpful. Yeah. But yeah, in terms of the other suggestions you made, I can see the sense in that. So sure. Thanks very much for that. No further questions from me. Anyone else in your team wanted to add anything, or is that are we good? Okay, great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. So <clears throat> our next submitter isn't scheduled on to 245. I don't suppose the Carter group's here yet, are they? Yes. Well, yeah, look, I'd be very happy for you to come up now. That's a really good use of our time. And then we can deal with the legal submissions, any questions arising from that. And then if we did have questions from Ms. Blackmore, we can maybe get her either on the phone or in or something. So, yeah, that's a good suggestion. Come on up. So just let me get the right document open. Sure. Right. All right, so thanks very much right. for that. And thank you for providing the pre-circulated legal submissions, which we've read. So you're probably um, pleased to hear you don't need to read those out loud to us, but you're very welcome now to highlight key points and then we'll see if we have questions for you. Thank you, sir. And just to introduce myself properly, um, it's Amy Hill from Chapman Trip. Um, so this is a, a single submission point uh, on behalf of Christchurch International Airport today. And it relates to the way that the airport noise contours are displayed on the mapping um, for this plan and uh, while it may seem in some ways fairly um, minor it, this is an area where the airport has experienced confusion in the past um, in other contexts so the the relief sought uh, in this airport submission is to uh, include a, a more detailed um, description of the contour or identification of the contour on the maps itself. So at present, I don't know if uh, it's possible to get them up or if you're aware of what it looks like, but there's a noise control overlay boundary, a noise control boundary overlay, which is the orange uh, diagonal lines. And that uh, 
relates to a number of different types of noise contour, if you will. So there's a port and rail and airport. And um, there are various rules which, which relate specifically to the crash at International Airport noise control boundary. But when one looks at the planning maps, unless you already know what that looks like, um, it's difficult to identify. So uh, CIL appreciates there is a, a new dynamic at play with the national planning standards, um, but we submit there's no, within the bounds of having to call it a noise control overlay, um, we submit there is scope to introduce a bit more detail into the mapping to assist plan users and otherwise uh, you might be leaving people who've never come across the concept before in the dark about whether their property lies within the airport noise uh, control boundary or not. Emma, is it possible to get the, um, the map up on the screen? So, Marcel, just while we're getting that up, um, just regarding Mr. Bonus and his and his accident and yes. his surgery. So we've now written down some questions for him, and I think you might have received those. Or... I did. Thank you. Yes, yeah, we um, uh, received them uh, yesterday evening, and so they've been passed to Mr. Bonus. And when he's <laughs> back um, from surgery, he'll yeah. prioritise that. And yeah. thank you for your understanding. Yeah, um, that's all right. And I think. Um, we were suggesting maybe a date of Friday for responding, but just let us know if um, if that's too soon in terms of what his surgery he's having, et cetera, and just- Thank you, yeah. The, the yeah. time frame we're working towards is at the end of the, um, and I know this relates to the EI hearing, but not this one, but the general rule is that within two weeks of the hearing end of the staff do us a reply report. So it'd be very, obviously we'd need to see Mr. Bonus's answers to our questions. We're interested, but the staff would need to see those before they finalize their reply report. Mm -hmm. So sort of a week, a week and a half after this coming Friday would be a good time frame to get those question answers back. Great, thank you. Yeah. As far as I understand it, um, he's been advised he'll be able to be back next week. So I suppose you have to wait and see with these things, but it should. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, That's thanks. Fine. Uh, yeah, so this is very helpful, thanks. You can see the, when you go to the plan, you you can see the orange blob and that really large, um, large part which extends from Christchurch district through is the airport noise contour, but there's nothing specific on the map that identifies it as such. And there's nothing in the mapping descriptions which explains what those lines mean or what why there's a noise control associated with them and um i suppose uh ms blackmore can explain further but um having worked with her on these issues in christchurch in a number of years sort of once the dust has settled on plan review processes in particular and you have maybe a change in planning staff and new staff members arriving uh there can be confusion around how the contours work what they mean and why they're there and that plays into then uh you know the proper implementation of those contours and their rules. It's good. You're happy now if we have said we have questions for you. So we'll start. Raymond, any questions? Gareth, um, you, thank you. Yeah, just I'm just reading your legal submissions about the national planning standards, and the point you're making seems a good point that you're making. And I, I'm just interested to know whether the national planning standards do, in fact, um, provide the flexibility to be able to do what you're saying because we heard some submissions earlier from about the definitions um, we can create apparently the councils create subcategories of definitions which is what seems to give some leeway but I'm not sure when it comes to overlays is there any um, anything in there in particular other than what you've highlighted here that we could use there? um no so I had another look through and I actually have the um district spatial layer standard and the mapping standard here um, I had another look yesterday and my read of the national planning standards is uh, you must have that the council can only use spatial layers that are zones overlays precincts or specific controls so if this is an overlay that's fine <laughs> um, then 
the um, where a noise control boundary overlay is included in the map, it has to use that orange hatching symbol. Um, but there's no further prescription around, you know, whether it could also have a label shown on the map saying this is the 50 dBA uh, Christchurch International Airport noise control boundary, for example. Um, Which is what we seem to have there, don't we? It's, well, we, we don't have, yeah, we do. <laughs> so that's, that's good to zoom in at that level. I was not aware you could zoom in that close and see that. Um, and so the other component then of the relief is to explain that more clearly in the uh, description of, each, of the overlays. So that would be, if that is what people will see, and when they come up on the property search function, they'll see that that's great. That is, that would um, give effect to Christchurch Airport's relief partly. And then mm. at the end of um, the legal submissions, for the description of the overlay that CIAL would also seek though, that there is a sort of a sub description, which explains what that contour is and why it's there. Yep. All right, now for any questions? Okay, so it seems like the mapping, once you zoom in, does tell you once what you the various things are. Sorry. Um, and then in terms of uh, definitions, I think it's important generally that the definition is just a definition and doesn't have policy components in it. But I think <clears throat> maybe if staff could reflect on the um, thing that's at the end of the legal submissions, and particularly the wording in blue, which was the original relief sought, and just consider whether or not a cross-reference to the appropriate policy or rule might assist. So if someone thinks, oh, what does that 50 dBA line mean? And if there is a definition and it just then refers you to the appropriate provisions, I think noise rule R4 is relevant to the 55 dB line. And I think we have a recommendation from the urban growth hearing, UG policy eight is recommended to deal with the 50 dBA. So just some kind of pointer might be helpful for users of the plans. And if you could just give that some thought, and I think that's what you're asking for as well. Yes, or if, um... So the blue was there a further refinement and the red was relief as sought originally, but so if the, okay. there was, and I take the point about definitions generally avoiding policy content, but if the council planning staff considered there were perhaps further amendments that could be made to the description yeah. drafted, which would avoid the policy content, yeah. but retain a bit more specificity, uh, then that would be. Yeah. And just thinking aloud, so what I'm thinking of is the words in blue. So I've got the colours back to front, but the words in blue, and then maybe just a cross reference to, to the relevant provisions like C rule uh, four or C policy UGPA or something like that. You know, I give it some thought and see what you come back with. And if you need to liaise with the airport uh, personnel, then if that would help you, then go ahead and do that too. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so now I think we do need to wait to 2.45. No, no, that was helpful. It was, good. it was a good use of time. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So, Emma, could you just let um, Jill Thompson know that we've gone a little bit um, quicker than we thought, and if she could be here, we're relatively close to 2.45-ish, so that would be helpful.
Right, well, just a bit more formally, um, <clears throat> reconvene the hearing of submissions on the um, introduction and general provisions chapter of the proposed district plan. Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you very much for providing your pre-circulated material, the legal submissions and the evidence, and of course your original submission. We've read all of that material, so you'll be pleased to know you don't need to read that out loud to us, but if you have um, tabled new material, then we'd like you just to read it out, uh, the respective author. And if you want to highlight any key points from the pre-circulated material, then you're welcome to do that as well. And probably we'll maybe hear from both of you and then see if we have questions that you can answer either individually or collectively after that. Is that okay? Great, yeah, great. Thank you very much. Um, so my name is uh, Lucy Forrester. I am counsel for uh, the various Carter Group entities listed in those legal submissions. Um, here on behalf of Chapman Tripp. Um, so we provided evidence um, in relation to this topic by Mr. Jeremy Phillips, a planner, um, generally uh, happy with um, the conclusions in the officer's report subject to um, one reasonably minor point relating to the definition of, of site and um, more particularly um, the def a, a possible additional additional definition for nominal sites. Um, so the definition of site is prescribed in the national um, planning standards and therefore cannot be modified. There's this uncertainty around whether the wording um, of that definition would cover nominal sites um, and only providing for legal legally defined sites will cause unnecessarily unnecessary inflexibility, uncertainty, and cost to plan users um, while having no obvious um, benefits. Uh, we note that under the national planning standards, local authorities are entitled to include additional defined terms. Um, and as such, we consider it appropriate that an additional defined term is included for nominal sites um, to, to ensure that these are also captured. Um, and yeah, I've set that out in, in the legal submission what we are proposing for that definition, and that'll be covered more by um, Mr. Jeremy Phillips. Um, but we are otherwise seeking that um, the definition for nominal site is also included as a term alongside all of the provisions that include the term site in the district plan. Um, that makes sense. So um, thank you. I'll pass it on to Mr. Phillips now. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Jeremy Phillips. I'm a senior planner and director practicing with Novo Group Limited in Christchurch. Um, actually, before I kick into it, I assume you'd like me to read right through my summary? Sure. Um, so I have particular experience in uh, urban land use development planning in Greater Christchurch and through that have a clear understanding of how district plan provisions are applied and the implications of those who are contemplating development activities. The introduction and general provisions as proposed by the officer are generally supported for the reasons set out in their report. So my evidence on this hearing topic relates to the definition of site and the proposed plan and amendments that are required in my view to this definition to provide for nominal sites. I consider that firstly provision should be made for nominal sites as an additional term that provides for the administration of rules to an area of land or a volume of space that is shown on a plan with defined boundaries, notwithstanding that such boundaries may not be legally defined or otherwise subject to an approved survey plan of subdivision. Secondly, in the absence of this additional term, that the definition of site that's proposed will result in unnecessary and unreasonable inflexibility and consenting requirements with associated uncertainty, inefficiency and costs to users of the plan. Thirdly, there are no obvious benefits in my view to precluding nominal sites and providing for nominal sites would not in my view alter the effect or the outcomes of the plan. The submitters consider that provision can and should be made for nominal sites as an additional term with the use of that term alongside the term site throughout the plan on the basis that nominal sites are, are distinct, sorry, they are distinct and they do not have the same or equivalent meaning as sites as defined in the national planning standard. The definition of site cannot be altered as it reflects the requirements of the national planning standards. It is not clear from the wording of that definition, however, whether it would include nominal sites which might not be formally or legally defined. I note that the relief sought by submitters would be consistent with the administration of the operative cell and district plans definition of site and indeed other district plans. I consider that Council does have scope to provide for the requested relief through the introduction of an additional defined term for nominal sites 
is the national planning standards also provide that if required, firstly, district plans may define B, additional terms that do not have the same or equivalent meaning as a term defined in the definitions list. And secondly, point three, where a definition in the definitions list is used, consequential amendments may be required to the policy statement or plan to ensure that the application of the definition does not alter the effect or outcomes of policy statements or plans. I also note that the recommendations on submissions report for the first set of national planning standards specifically noted that if councils wish to set out specific requirements or allowances for a property where an activity spans a number of legal sites, then they may do so using a different term. Whilst that report specifically considered sites spanning a number of records of title, I consider that the same issues and concerns arise with sites that can constitute only part of a larger record of title. Consistent with the relief sought, I therefore consider that an additional defined term for nominal site should be included in the proposed plan alongside references to the term site as follows. And the suggestion in terms of the definition would be nominal site means an area of land or volume of space shown on a plan with defined boundaries, notwithstanding that such boundaries may not be legally defined or otherwise subject to an approved survey plan of subdivision. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thank you for that. We'll see if we have questions for you, Ray, when we start at your end. Yes, um, I read your legal submissions dated the 6th of August, requesting a new definition for the nominal site, and I couldn't remember reading the request before, so I checked the submitter's original submission, and I couldn't find it. Can you show me where it is in the original submission? Um, yep, so it, it will be in, in this, our submission on the definition of, of site, um, and Apologies, I, I don't have our original submissions right in front of us, but um, the submitters had intended that that um, that that definition did include nominal site as, as it currently does in the Selwyn District Plan. So, um, is that what we saw? I was looking for the words nominal site. If, if, if I can assist, the submission was on the definition of site, and yes. it was only when the officer's report pointed out um, or clarified that that was a a defined term in the national planning standard and therefore there wasn't um, scope to change the definition of site because that's um, mandatory under the national planning standards that um, you know, my evidence has suggested the, the equivalent relief could be achieved through having a, a standalone definition for nominal sites so it would achieve the same, same outcome as what was requested in the submission. So just reading here, our submission sorts that um, we amend the definition of site to include an area of land or volume of space shown on a plan with defined boundaries, whether legally or otherwise defined boundaries. So we want, we were there making, trying to make that um, distinction and just for ease of reference, I guess nominal site is what you would call that um, and, and to um, as we realised you couldn't change the, the definition for site, we, we are now suggesting a new definition. Okay, um, thank you. Um, just one more question, and I think it's to your group. The definition for department store um, in your markup version at tab on the table, point 14. Well, I understand the point that is made here. Do you consider that the reader would find the ANZIC or ANZ SIC code reference to be user friendly when plan users have to go to yet another document to find the definition. Um, to be fair, I'm, um, I don't think we, we necessarily took issue with what the officer um, recommended there. So um, I'm shooting from the hip for want of a better term a little bit in terms of responding to your question, but from experience with um, reference to ANZIC codes and the operative um, plan um, to define department stores and indeed other activities um, it, it, it's, it's effectively been the best um, way of providing some clarity for a, a situation that has vagaries and um, a variety of situations so ENZIC rightly or wrongly classifies different types of retail and commercial activities according to its methodology and it's uh, you know widely used and recognised um, standard um, it, it's quite clear in terms of where things fit or don't fit. Um, so in that sense, it's proved to be quite a useful, in my experience, um, reference point to work out where a different type of commercial activity fits because what's a department store to me 
might be something different for you or, or someone else and how you try and then define that in the district plan um, is, is potentially a bit of a head scratcher and you may not end up pleasing anyone. So from experience, the ENSIT codes have provided a, um, a consistent way that's well understood for what certain activities are or aren't. I can understand what you're saying and I don't disagree with you, but I'm thinking from the ordinary lay person's point of view to have to go to another document to get a definition of what a department store is. And, and look, I would accept that that's not a perfect situation. Again, I think the trade-off is, do you try and come up with a definition um, that tries to capture the range that a department store or any other commercial activity that references ANZIC might be, um, and in doing so, create uncertainty, again, for those lay people or for others. Um, so I, I think I'd, I'd have to accept it's not a perfect situation, and referencing other documents um, needs to be done with caution, especially if you're going to send someone off down the proverbial rabbit hole. Um, I would say, again, ANZIC, I think if there's links to it, or if it's an easily found document and it's... it's um, clear to navigate through that standard that should provide some comfort and again my experience has been ENSIC is relatively clear but I appreciate that there might be lay people that, that find that a bit tougher. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, just a couple of questions. Um, first of all, I noticed your paragraph eight, um, you say that the relief sought by submitters will be consistent with the administration of the operative cell and district plans definition of site. So do you, I, I didn't know that, do you, do you know what the reason was for council not carrying on that definition into the proposed plan? Is, is, are you aware of what that reason might be? Um, only only what's been conveyed in the officer's report that the hands are tied, so to speak, in terms of the national right. planning standard. Right, um, and, and I was just going to ask, uh, just to, I've, I'm an experienced planning practitioner, but I've never really dealt with this issue before. I'm a bit surprised that I haven't because I've dealt with a lot of subdivisions, but if, if you can help me, I go into your paragraph in your evidence in chief, paragraph 12, um, where you define the um, national planning standard definition, definition of site. Um, under C, it says, it's one of four things. Um, under C, the land comprised in a single allotment or balance area on an approved survey plan of subdivision for which a separate record of title could be issued without further consent of the council. So I think I understand that. So, so what is a nominal site if it's if it's not that? Um, yeah. um, maybe by way of example, in terms of um, where in my line of work or experience, you often see the nominal sites. I mean, a, a common example would be someone has a residential site, they want to knock over the house or it's vacant and they want to put three um, you know, fee simple um, houses on fee simple lots, that they want the certainty of a land use consent to do that in the first instance. And once they've got the certainty of the land use consent, then they get on with getting the building consent and the subdivision consent um, whilst they're underway with construction or sales. So in terms of the sequence, of uh, it's preferable to get the certainty of the land use consent before you incur the expense and the time and admin of going through those subsequent stages. So um, defining nominal sites at that stage would say, well, we might have a lot of 1,000 square metres and we're going to nominate through lots of 300 for the purposes of getting our land use consent, it gets approved on that basis and then that will flow through ultimately into a subdivision um, consent that formalises those boundaries. Um, another example um, would be in, in a Rolleston context, large um, industrial parcels of land. So uh, as an example, like the iPort subdivision over there, um, I think like an 18 or a 40 year parcel of land, so quite significant. Um, zoned for different types of commercial or large format retail activity and in terms of staging the development um, it's sufficient to define part of that site that's going to be developed for, um, for a land use proposal and, and a consensus issued and assessed on that basis. And the alternative as read under that national planning standard or the way I read it is that you would need to have a separate record of um, title or a, an approved survey plan for which no further consent is needed that corresponds to those boundaries. Um, we need to have those existing boundaries in place. Isn't, isn't that what C says? It, it says um, if, if it's not a title in its own right, it, it's, it would meet the requirements for a title. In other words, it's got sufficient land area to, to be subdivided in the future. Isn't it, it could be issued without further consent of the council. Is, is my misreading that? Well, I think the, the key part in that is the requirement for it to be on an approved survey plan of subdivision. So that would, in my view, would necessitate if you need a subdivision okay. consent. All right, and, and 
thank you for that. And that makes sense. And and the final question was just in relation to the rules, how if we accept the relief you're seeking to um, create a definition of the nominal sites, does it have any impact on the the rules, like minimum site area, dwellings per site, those sorts of things, which council are presumably got policies around, you know, density and other other requirements. Is there any impact? Not, yeah. not in my view, because you're still working towards the standard. So in terms of a setback from a nominal boundary, um, you'd still be achieving those amenity protections in terms of nominating a site a, a site with a um, defined area to meet a minimum density standard. You still have to achieve that. Um, I think the concern sometimes with nominal sites is that what if things change? And I, I guess there's, you know, there's a monitoring and enforcement um, question there. And ultimately, from experience, it flows through that you've got the safe, safety net of the subsequent subdivision consenting process and the building consent processes to check that um, what you've said you'll do and what's authorised in a land use consent based on nominal sites actually um, plays out in reality. And again, in my 20 odd years of experience, I haven't seen that to be a, a major problem. Um, by way of example, Christchurch City has had nominal sites um, you know, for an excess of 20 years and it's commonly sort of understood and administered. So, And conversely, somewhere like Waimakariri, where, where I don't think they have um, nominal sites and I might be corrected on that but the the um, situation where subdivision consents are required concurrently with land use consents is a pain in the backside in terms of cost and process that can um, generally be dealt with later. So, so what I'm taking from that is in your evidence there's no negative outcomes from adopting this? Not that I can see. From no. a planning point of view, okay, thank you. There's got a number of issues I'd like to explore with you. As you say, the word site is defined in the national planning standard. So you're suggesting to us a new definition, nominal site. But if I was reading that afresh, I'd say, well, site's defined in the national planning standard. So a nominal site is a nominal one of those. So that doesn't really work. Um, possibly a question I could defer, defer to Council on in terms of like more specific terms and the nesting of definitions. Um, you could potentially give it another name. I mean, I think it's um, the, the term nominal sites used on the basis that it, um, it's, again, my experience commonly sort of understood what that is. Um, I would have thought if it's a you know, variant of site and probably picking up on the, um, the report on the national planning standards and recognising that this issue. Um, I would have thought there's a there's a way around that for one of a bit of two. What's the legal advice on that? <clears throat> Wouldn't the word the definition that's supported to the word site in the national planning standard is, is set in stone? So if a reader of the plan was reading it and they said, okay, well, we need to look at a nominal site, the national planning standard defines site, so a nominal one of those. What what is that? Yeah, and I, I suppose you could probably distinguish that by the use of you know, capitals or, or hyperlinking within the plan, but there's nothing preventing you from um, defining an additional term that also happens to use, I, I see what you're saying, that that word that is actually defined. And I'm, I'm sure I've seen other examples in the national planning standards um, where that has been used, where there's kind of subcategories of, of one definition that might well use um, the same word. I think, I, th I think it's, possible and um, I'm th I'm thinking a bit off the cuff here I probably have to go back and check but um, I don't think there's anything preventing that and I think it's um, it's it's done elsewhere um, I think it just comes back to that um, site does not have the same or equivalent meaning as as nominal site and it is therefore appropriate to to add an extra definition whether you call it something else um, it's fine as well. Maybe if I, if I could just jump in there too, I think, I mean, paragraph 24.1 of my um, evidence in chief noted that, that um, the standards provide, you can um, have additional terms that do not have the same or equivalent meaning. So I guess the key question to satisfy yourself with is would a nominal site um, have a, the same or equivalent meaning as site or a distinct term? And I think if you, on my, my evidence or my view is that they are different because you've got a narrow, definition of site under the planning standard and a nominal site is inherently something different. Yeah. All right. And then my second question cuts more to the merits of your suggestion. So wouldn't isn't it appropriate though to get your subdivision consent first? 
that's what seems to happen a lot of places elsewhere in New Zealand. Not my experience. <laughs> um, no, I mean, uh, look, there's pros and cons. I think it, um, the advantage I've seen is that it allows um, people to get the certainty that they can ultimately do what it is that they want to do in terms of land. Because, uh, sorry, I'll restart, because I think sometimes subdivision is not always needed or desired. So for example, if you're developing for investment purposes and you're building three units and you're going to hold them, you may not need to subdivide. So the key issue there is can you actually build the houses that you want to build? Um, secondly, the the nature of the subdivision and the tenure and um, how you do that again may depend on what, what the end goal is. So, um, so I don't necessarily see a need to um, have the certainty of a subdivision consent ahead of a um, Head of a land use consent. My understanding is too with things like multi unit developments, you actually need the certainty of where the building position is to assist with unit titling and the final placement of boundaries and, and things like that. So there's actually some practical, I mean, that's probably a question for a surveyor, but again, my experience has been that um, that unit titling type of um, arrangement actually doesn't occur until the building consent is reasonably well advanced because you need that certainty of where the, where the finished um, lines need to go. And then just continuing on with your paragraph um, 21 and the pre-circulated evidence, and you've discussed it today too, that under your proposal, the developer will get a land use consent to do something that wouldn't otherwise be allowed to do unless the site was subdivided. And then you say, but then you can go and get a subdivision consent after that. Well, what happens if that consent's declined? If the subdivision consent's declined? Yeah. Then you just end up with the land, you know, the land use authorised, but not the subdivision consent. That may not be a problem, depending on the, you know, the needs of the applicant. But again, I think in terms of from an efficiency perspective, the cost of obtaining a certificate of compliance or a land use consent is often considerably less than that required for a subdivision consent. So again, in terms of the, the order of things, getting the certainty that I can build the outcome before I can, you know, define a different form of tenure through the subdivision consent has some. Um, practical attraction so that that possibly does exist and if, uh, um, you know if you had a circumstance where the subdivision matters were quite distinct from the land use matters and they warranted consent refusal well that that risk um, does exist I guess the, the flip side of that is possible too that you get a subdivision consent and then fine you can't actually do the land use you want on it so all right any follow-up questions just a follow-up question that's something that just occurred to me was the does it have any um, impact on the reserve contribution type situation where you could presumably build dwellings without creating the titles and, and, and essentially not, not pay the reserve contributions that go with that. Well, the development levies. Well, the development, the development levies would probably still, no, they may not apply if it's not a subdivision, that's right. Yeah, again, that, that, not something I've specifically turned my mind to here, again, from experience and probably in a Christchurch context where your development contributions are levied on resource consent, subdivision consent or building consent and they um, can consider it all three of those times and changes that might transpire, but it's generally the, the activity of increasing development and demand that, that um, results in that development contribution being charged, so that shouldn't necessarily be. Yeah, okay, and, and thanks for that. And just finally, and signal to the officers, if I understand it correctly, that if the operative plan has a definition for nominal sites and, and the council now feels constrained by the, the MPSs, um, I'm reading into that that it's a valid technique and it has merit if it's in the operative plan. Um, so I'd be interested to know whether the idea has merit and it's purely a, a, a discussion around the NPS and whether it can, can or can't be done. Um, so I'd be interested to hear a response to that at some stage. And the first issue is, is it in the operative plan? Yeah, that's right. That is. Yeah. <laughs> and in what format? All right, well, thanks very much for that. So the office is what we'd look forward as a panel to in the reply report you um, addressing this in a reasonable amount of depth. I'll be interested in seeing the advantages and disadvantages of what's being sought and particularly to outline to us what the current practice actually is and what the provisions in the operative plan actually are and if they've been abandoned, why that was the case. And if that's already covered in a section 32 report somewhere, just refer us to that. And if not, can you write some new words on that for us? Thank you very much. Thanks for coming in.